And now I'm going to say something very foolish. Do you want me to turn on the, this one or this one? That doesn't help. Let's try this one. Does that work? Yep. That way, in case I accidentally stray from the mic. Uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't say this, but uh, Hispanic preachers have a tendency to talk longer than Anglo preachers, so... <laughs> So I have now committed myself to beating Felix. So if they're dismissed this morning before I let you out, you can talk to me afterwards, okay? Okay. That's okay. To, I, I'm not being racist because all of my Hispanic friends remind me of that, that uh, you guys don't talk as long as our, our preachers do. Okay. Oh, have you ever heard the expression, everything happens for a reason? No. Have you ever used the expression, everything happens for a reason? I keep getting close to that. Everything happens for a reason. What does that mean? What does that, what, what does that mean to you? Uh, I often hear people say, well, you know, everything happens for a reason. And I'm not sure I understand what they're thinking, their thoughts. I'm not sure if I could say I agree or disagree. Now, if they're talking in the scientific terminology of cause and effect of, you know, this, uh, James is a smart dude, scientist type guy. He, if you do this, this will happen. There's the laws of science and all this kind of stuff. If that's what they're talking about, I understand. I, I, I think I understand. Uh, it took me a while to get to that point. When I was about three or four years old, I remember sitting in the living room with uh, my mom and dad. And they were on the, uh, on the couch reading a, a newspaper so that dates it right there, a newspaper. And I was in the floor playing with the little lamp. And for you older people, again, you will, you will remember the little children's lamps that had the music box in the bottom. And they had the little bitty bulb, teeny nicey little thing. Well, I was about three or four years old. And the bulb wasn't burning. So I thought, I'm going to check this out. And so I unscrewed the bulb and stuck my thumb in there. Uh, so if you want to talk to me about cause and effect, uh, I can tell you what happens when you stick your thumb in a lamp that's plugged into the wall. Uh, it, it hurts. If you want to talk to me in terms of whether well, there was a reason, a cause, it, it was intended for this. Well, according to my parents, it was intended to teach me a lesson because they said, well, I hope you learned your lesson. Sad news is I didn't. And about three or four minutes later, I did the same thing. Again, I'm a slow learner, I'll admit that, but yes, I did eventually learn the lesson. So if you want to talk to me about this happens for a reason because of cause and effect, I, I think I can get there with you. But I, I hear an awful lot of people uh, take it maybe to a different level. Many, many years ago, our, our company acquired another company uh, I won't mention, it, it well, it's, it's a Texas company, and you know them Texans. I'm sorry if we have anybody viewing from Texas, but I say that because there's a special weekend coming up next week, and we're trying to get everybody psyched up for the OU Texas game. But this, uh, this idea of we acquired this block of business, we're going to bring it into our company, they're probably, they told us they were like two or three weeks behind, as it turned out they were like, two to three months behind on their claims. So we were working seven days a week. Everybody, including the president all the way down to, everybody was working, we were doing all this kind of stuff. And we were so far behind that our personal affairs had to be put on the back burner. One of which was I needed to get a social security card for my daughter so she could work in an after school program. To do that, I had to have her birth certificate and somehow that got lost. So I found myself squeezing in about 30 minutes to an hour to go down and pick up. Now, that birth certificate was supposed to be ready for me and probably was ready in their office, but I hadn't counted on having to stand in line. And I had to stand in line and I st stood in line, stood in line. Finally, I was able to get that birth certificate, but I didn't have time to get to get a social security card now because I'd stood in line too long. 
And I had to be back to the office by 9.30. And it was just a little bit after 9 o'clock. And if you're old enough to remember what happened in 1995, about 9 o'clock one morning, you may know that the social, you may remember the Social Security building was the Murrah building that was destroyed. So I should have been in the Murrah building when it came down. I had a good, very good friend, Willie Edwards. His daughter, teenage daughters, run late. Go figure. If you don't know that, uh, I'm, I'm letting you know in advance. His teenage daughter was running late, and he missed his 9 o'clock appointment in the Murrah building. Okay? And I have heard people say that, well, God really blessed you. God was really looking over you because you weren't there. And in one sense, I understand and accept that, but my question then becomes, what about all the people who died? Why wasn't God looking after them? Are you saying that God wasn't? You see where I'm going with this? Sometimes we try to, in a very good effort, I, I don't deny that, we try to explain things for God. Well, this is what God intended. This is, this is why this happened. It all happened for a reason. And we try to do this. There's some part of us as a human that we want to try to grasp, to understand things. Uh, Isaiah 55, where God says, My ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts are higher. Uh, but yet, most of us in the religious world spend a great amount of our time trying to explain our God, which is ridiculous in the first place. Uh, we try to explain a God that we can understand, and to be perfectly honest, I don't want a God that I can understand because that's not much of a God. If he's down here on the Dwight Heron level, he ain't much of a God, okay? So we have to some point in time submit to the idea that he knows better than me. Okay? Some of you are hearing this. Some of you younger ones, oh, they're gone. We'll hear it in the future. Those of us older ones remember hearing this. Do it because I say so. How does that sit? When your dad says, you just do it because I said so. For some of us, it really rubs us the wrong way. But realistically, that's what God is saying. Yeah, I could explain it, but you wouldn't understand. So just do it because I said so. Just do it because I said so. All of this is an introduction into the idea of we're going back to the series of secrets and mysteries that uh, it's going to actually be a three-week series. The next two, this week and next week, we're going to cover mysteries. Back in July, we talked about secrets. Uh, this idea of trying to explain things that uh, maybe we don't grasp, trying to find out how they happened, trying to figure out how things work. Um, real quick, why does he keep saying real quick and he's not real quick? Uh, a few weeks ago, I got to meet a man by the name of Walter Castro. He's the new minister over at the uh, Church of Christ in Capitol Hill, the Capitol Hill Church of Christ. Uh, some of us refer to it as Lighthouse. Uh, they have Lighthouse Medical uh, Clinic there. Uh, Walter's super, super guy. And, and in the process of our conversation, we kept coming up with all of these similarities, the, these things that just seem to be fitting into place at the right time. What's going on over at the Lighthouse, over at the uh, Capitol Hill Church Christ, if you're not aware of it, is basically the same thing that's been going on at the uh, Christian Service Center for the last year and a half. Uh, Memorial Road is rethinking what's going on in Capitol Hill. We are rethinking what's going on in Capitol Hill, and we're trying to revive uh, and get things going. And they're going through the same process, and I'm thinking, this is just way too much of a coincidence, or is it? You ever get to that point, it's a coincidence, or maybe God is doing it? Well, I, I'm reluctant to attribute things to God, from my understanding. So Walter and I have come up with a terminology that I will use a few times this morning. It's called heavenly coincidences. How about that? 
Uh, it's a coincidence that I'm not sure I would necessarily attribute to God. He may not appreciate that. But I do see a heavenly benefit from it. And there are several things that have come out in the last few weeks. For example, two weeks ago, Scott Bulmer's sermon on contentment. Kind of primed the pump for this week because back in July when we started this series, that's what we were talking about, contentment. The secret of contentment. In Philippians where Paul talks about it, the secret, his secret of contentment. And we like to, I, I, I love the passage uh, in, in the message translation from Philippians chapter 4 where it says, I have found the recipe for being happy. Oh, re- there is a recipe for happiness? Okay, Paul, what, what is the recipe? Well, it, there's a secret ingredient. Well, tell me what that secret ingredient is. Remember we talked about Neil Carrick and, and, and secret for his, his pies, the crust on his pies. Do you know people who are cooks that fix the same thing that you do, but for some reason theirs is always better and you wish yours could be like theirs, and you go to them and you say, tell me your secret. What's, what's the secret? Oh, that's what's going on in Philippians chapter 4. We go to Paul and we say, Paul, as Scott mentioned two weeks ago, he's sitting in prison writing a joy book. And that makes no sense. And he's talking about in all the times when he didn't have what he needed, he was content. Well, how do you do that? Paul would not make a very good American because that is not the way we do things. We have to have more. We have to have more than what we have right now, but that's okay. We, we, we've got set up for retirement and I'm gonna do all of this. I'm all the time going to get more and 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 more. And an awful lot of the times as we talked about as the scriptures that, would, that, um, that were read this morning, awful lot of the times it connects to money. I've got to have money. And if I just get more money, then I'll truly be happy. Then I'll be able to do the things. And sometimes we rationalize and say, then, to, then I can be the religious person and do the don't. I will give my 10% and I will do all of this funding and I'll do this if I just have more and more and more. And Paul said, how about if you have less, less, and less? Are you going to be less contented? Paul says, let me tell you the secret of being content. And he does that in Philippians chapter 4. Those are secrets. Not dark, dirty secrets that you don't want to know, but those are the secrets that you really would like to know so that your life, that your recipe for life can be even better. Interestingly enough, again, this is one of those heavenly coincidences. Uh, I I was, had this last week off and I was able to get caught up on some reading. I actually read two and a half books this week. And one of them talked about this very topic the idea of secrets of happiness. You know who came up with that idea? Well, the Greeks had a word for the feeling one has when one is happy. It's makarios. It's a feeling of contentment when one knows one's place in the world and it is satisfied with that place. And before you think I'm saying that the Greeks had it all figured out, makarios is a word that Jesus used when he said, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. And we say, how in the world can you be happy? Maybe a better translation instead of happy is contented. You have found your place. When peacemakers make peace, they have found their place. When you can be a follower of Christ, and go into places that others are afraid to go, when you can suffer for Christ as a Christian, Paul says, I found my place. I'm happy. I'm content. Makarios can be translated happiness or contentment. Are you content with whatever this world throws at you because you're following Christ. That was pretty much the lesson we had a few weeks ago. Then lo and behold, we talk about mysteries and uh, that's covered in the second verse that was written this, that was read this morning. Great is the mystery of godliness. There are a lot of mysteries in the Bible. 
mysteries that uh, we don't always understand, mysteries that we can't figure out, mysteries that just that uh, kind of linger out there. But who doesn't love a, a good secret and who doesn't love a good mystery? You want to check things out. Your curiosity is piqued. So next week, we'll spend actually more time talking about the mysteries of godliness. But again, that is not anything new because Jesus originated it. Matthew chapter 13. And I know I'm rambling, but there's a, there's a method to my madness if you will just hang on with me for a few more minutes. Matthew chapter 13, verses 11 through 17. He answered and said to them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Do you remember that passage? The disciples had just come to Jesus saying, How come you speak to us in parables? Uh, because, to be honest, Jesus, when you get through with the parable, we're all scratching our head trying to figure out, okay, exactly what is he trying to tell us. For whoever has, to him shall be more shall be given, and he shall have an abundance, but he whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Again, that one is causing us to scratch our heads. But then he says, therefore I speak to them in parable, because while seeing... They do not see, and while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in their case of the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of, the, of this people has become dull, and their ears scarcely hear. They have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn again, and I should heal them. But blessed are you because they see in your eyes they hear. Why is it that some people get it and some people don't? Why is it that sometimes I get it and sometimes I don't? Vine's Expository Dictionary defines mystery as used in the New Testament as this. In the New Testament, mystery denotes not the mysterious, like we normally think of an English word, but that which being outside the range of unassisted natural apprehension can be made known only by divine revelation and is made known in a manner and at a time appointed by God and to those who are illuminated by his spirit. In the ordinary sense of the mystery, and sense of mystery implies that knowledge is withheld. In scripture, the significance is truth revealed. It's, again, most of the mysteries of the Bible, not all, there are a few, John Pickens, again, another heavenly coincidence, had a great sermon last week about heaven, and, the, and, and that's a mysterious place we don't understand. I think we've got a glimpse, or we have an imagination, or what we think heaven might be like, but we don't really know. We won't know until we get there. But there are other mysteries that can be revealed, but they can only be revealed through heavenly assistance through the spiritual means of getting in contact with, with God himself and his word and spending time. Those who walked off scratching their heads saying, I don't understand this Jesus, probably most likely never came back. What made them different from his disciples was not that they didn't understand because the disciples had no clue either. The difference was the disciples kept going to Jesus. They kept going to Jesus asking the question. We can do the same thing today, going to his word or going to God in prayer saying, help me with this one. I don't understand. 
There's nothing wrong with going to God saying you don't understand that this is mysterious to me, this is beyond my comprehension. And the Father will listen, knowing that now you're willing to pay attention. Unfortunately, that's why so many times in life, it is the difficulties, the struggles that we face that actually draw us closer to God. Craig Rochelle has a great book, Hope in the... Uh, hope in the dark, believing God is good when life is not. And there's a section in there in which he talks about there's, uh, you don't see gardens, you don't see uh, things growing so much on the top of mountains, you see them growing down in the valleys. Now we all li- love mountain peaks, but down in the valleys is really where we mostly grow. The times in which we suffer difficulties, the time in which we go through challenges, those are the times that we go to God. And when we go to God, that's where we find our strength. That's when we find the answers to these mysterious questions. And next week we're going to be talking about the mystery of godliness. What is that all about? What does it mean to be like God? What does it mean? How do you go about doing that? What's the secret? What's the mystery? How does that play out? Jesus talked an awful lot about this. I'm trying to edit this morning's sermon. We can get get more into next week. Um, in, in your bulletin this week, there's, uh, there's a section I've mentioned before numerous times, the community with God. At the very end, there is a song I'd ask that you would uh, listen to. It, it, it's not in our song books. You'll have to get on, your, on the WWW, as us old codgers say. Get on your computer and pull up a song by Alison Krauss. There is a reason. Too often, we allow our lack of understanding to keep us away from God. Well, a God can't be good that allows something like that. And so if I can't understand it, God must be wrong. And we walk away. But then there are times in which we go to God and in pure honesty we look to him and cry out, I know there must be a reason, but I don't understand. That's faith. That's what faith is. Some people think faith is which church you go to or that you believe in God. Uh, That's not faith. Faith is following something that you don't necessarily understand, but you're doing it because your daddy said so. Because our father said so, I will follow. And this is what Paul will say. I will live my life according to what the Father has said, even when it makes no sense to me whatsoever. So take a, listen to that song. I love the lines to it. Uh, maybe you can relate to it. There's a reason. I know there's got a reason. For the life of me, I don't understand it, but I know he has a reason. John chapter 12, verse 27. I kind of wonder in humanity if that is really what's separates us in our godliness. When we come to those challenges in lives, things just flat don't make sense. John chapter 12, verse 27, Jesus said as he approached his crucifixion, Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. It's for this purpose that I came to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Therefore came a voice out of the heaven. I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. In just a minute, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. And if you want an example, if you want an example of how to live your life, But you may have to do so reluctantly. And for us, not knowing 
how the story is going to end, there is no greater example than the sacrifice Jesus made. Jesus laid down his life for sinful men. Jesus shed his blood for sinful men. That was not what I would have done. It's probably not what you would have done. How in the world can, can this be successful? Jesus said, I am fulfilling my purpose. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, what fulfills our purpose is that which makes us happy, that which makes us contented, that which fulfills our lives. That's happiness. That's macarios. That's contentment. As mysterious as it may seem and as strange as it may seem, going to God and asking, so what's the secret to happiness? And he says, the secret is following my son. We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper now. Uh, we're going to have a prayer. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity again. For, if, if, you're not, if you're new or visiting with us, we have table set up that have little cups in them. There are two cups. The bottom cup has the bread in it. The top cup has the juice in it. Um, but think about that. Think about that. How would you be willing to lay down your life for sinful men? Think about the sacrifice that Jesus made. And in so doing, that's how he was glorified.